study. I'm very excited to be presenting for this conference. I was so bummed when it got canceled last year because of the pandemic, um, but I'm just so impressed with the way that the network has been flexible in adapting this conference. It looks like it's a really good time and I'm, I'm uh, excited for you all that you get to participate in so many panels and workshops and whatnot. Um, my name is Levi Todd. I use they, them pronouns. Um, uh, I've also been advised that we've had an interpreter, um, so I'm also just gonna introduce myself um, as well in case anybody needs that for accessibility purposes. Um, I'm a white non-binary person. I have about shoulder length brown hair. I wear glasses and I've got some very cute earrings on if I don't say so myself. Um, and I'm the youth programs coordinator at also the Alliance of Local Service Organizations, um, which is a, a nonprofit that's based in Humboldt Park, um, but is expanding outward. So, there are a couple of things I want you to know about also, Luce, if you want a next slide. Um, so also works in partnership with people living in risk of violence to promote safer streets and homes. Um, so our two big focuses are community violence and domestic violence. And our agency specifically looks at the overlap about how um, violence that happens in our community um, can impact domestic violence, how domestic violence can lead to community violence. And so that's where we come. Um, that's our perspective that we bring to the table. Um, we do a lot of different programs and services. Um, most notably, we have a, a really expansive team of outreach workers that engage in violence interruption and relationship building in the community. So they're aiming to build relationships with youth and adults who are at risk of violence, um, potentially involved in street organizations. Um, they host peace circles, they um, host mediation between groups. Um, and then we also have a lot of job services readiness. Um, lately, we've been doing cannabis expungements under the new law. Um, and where I come to this work is I used to be a prevention educator. Um, and so I would visit um, CPS classrooms, grades six to 12 to deliver a eight week um, teen dating violence prevention curriculum that was at a previous job. I really loved that work. I loved working with young people. Um, and my role now is working on one of ALSO's national grant teams. So the Office on Violence Against Women is a federal agency that provides money um, to organizations to um, do a lot of different types of grant programs. But the team that I specifically work on supports recipients of funding from OBW, who are then using that grant money to engage in youth facing programs to try to prevent teen dating violence, pre prevent young people from experiencing sexual assault and stalking. Um, and so I'm kind of uh, supporting other organizations across the country, but I really miss uh, working at organizations in Chicago and that's why I'm enjoying seeing you all today. Um, just to give you all a preview of our, our time together today, we're gonna do um, a welcoming activity. Um, we're gonna uh, go over some key concepts um, that are gonna serve as a foundation for our conversation about youth leadership. Um, we're actually gonna talk about youth leadership and we're gonna use a model, um, it's called the ladder of youth participation that I think is a good assessment um, for our work um, at our organizations. We're gonna have a little bit of breakout room conversations um, and then we are going to come back, um, share what we talked about in our breakout rooms, um, share some closing thoughts, and then we'll have some time for questions. Um, I always try to end presentations sharing some resources with you all. Um, so um, I was introduced to this new Padlet resource that I think you all know about from the conference. So there is a Padlet for today's workshop um, and the slides that I use today, which include the resources can be found on that Padlet. Um, just to let you all know, I also have image descriptions in there. So the slides should be compatible with the screen reader if that's something that you use. Um, Luce, we can move to the next slide. All right, so I would love to start by doing a little activity. Um, and Luce, you can actually stop screen sharing because I'm gonna pull up the whiteboard feature if that's okay. Um, and I wanna have a conversation about one, what young people have taught you in your life, um, both just as a person and also in your professional work as an adult. And what specifically have young people taught you that has influenced or impacted how you think about teen dating violence um, or just healthy relationships with teenagers in general? And so I'm pulling up this little whiteboard feature and I'm fairly certain that you all should also have access to use this whiteboard. And if you haven't used it before, we're gonna to learn together. Um, but basically we are able to all work collaboratively in this space. Um, so I'm putting this question up at the top. What have you learned from young people? What have they taught you about relationships, general or teenagers? Teenage relationships is what I mean there. 
Um, and so there's a lot of different ways we can participate here. If you want to get your hands really in this whiteboard and just add your own text boxes, you can add drawings. I would welcome you to do that. Um, but also, if you just want to unmute yourself and share something, I'll capture it on the whiteboard and uh, make sure that it comes there. Um, or if you want to put something in the chat, that's another way that you can participate. Um, so I would love to start hearing from you all, whether you want to go off mute, whether you want to just hop in this whiteboard um, or share it in the chat. What have young people taught you um, in general? What do you feel like you've learned from them? And then what have they taught you about relationships, general or teenage ones? So I'm gonna start just to get our juices flowing, um, but I'm very aware that when I started in this work as a, a prevention educator, um, young people really, I went to 40 hour or whatnot, but young people really taught me um, about what the dynamics of teen dating violence look like today. So what unhealthy things were happening in relationships um, that I might not previously have been aware of. So I'm gonna put warning signs um, and dynamics of teen dating violence. So even though I might have been the one who was working at a, an organization trying to, to end teenage violence, it wasn't just me who was teaching them all the time. I felt like they were teaching me as well. Ooh, thank you, Rose, for just getting that document. Um, Hillary, I see, has said how to challenge the status quo. I love that. Yeah, so somebody shared an example of dynamics of teenage violence as like sharing passwords is something that comes up a lot. Um, what the signs of a, a quote unquote official relationship are. Boundaries with cell phones, yep. Somebody in the chat said dynamics of isolation. Gustavo said, how many teens are actually in unhealthy relationships? Thank you everybody for just hopping in and participating. We can keep doing this for a little bit longer. How prevalent domestic violence is. Mm, I was hoping someone would say it. How pop culture inform, oops, informs ideas of domestic violence slash healthy relationships or normalizes domestic violence. Yes, absolutely. Somebody else said justifying control if abusive person claims, why am I not just copying and pasting y'all? That would be so much simpler. All right. That's not what I wanted, but that's fine. I'm just trying to keep up with all our beautiful ideas here. I'm gonna put outfits here as shorthand. I'm gonna start doing shorthand from the ones in the comments. Um, but yes, absolutely. Conversations about what a partner is wearing. I've seen that come up a lot. Uh-huh, outfits. I'm gonna put in parentheses here like safety concern. So couching that language and what sounds like healthy, healthy language, healthy approaches. Just how many things happened when I was younger that were not good examples of relationships. So teaching us to revisit our own relationships or to rethink. I think this is a great. I'm also gonna add some fun ones to this list here. Working with young people has always taught me how to root myself um, in fun. We don't do that enough in adult spaces. We don't intentionally try to have fun too often, I think. And young people always remind me that that's something we should actually always plan to do. Um, somebody else said how all genders are socialized into harm, doing or into accepting abusive behavior. I'm gonna put gender and socialization. Not to take myself too seriously, cause they won't, uh-huh, mm-hmm. <laughs> they humble you, how not to take myself seriously, too seriously, because they won't. Ooh, assuming abusive people would be ugly, implying that abusive behavior would be okay if the person was hot. Okay, this is such a great list, y'all. We're running out of space on the screen. But I just wanted to do this activity to show you all um, that we're just aware um, of how much young people have taught us that um, you know, we are not these experts that are coming into classrooms to talk to them about domestic violence because we know so much that they actually teach us so much um, and that this is a partnership between us, between adults and young people. 
And that if we're wanting to end teen dating violence, we need to encourage those partnerships. And in fact, we actually kind of need to center young people as the leaders who are telling us what we need to be doing. Um, because they know their communities way better than we do. They know their peers way better than we do. Um, and so this is not just a value to them to make sure that our programs, our services are um, actually resonating with them and speaking to them, but that they're actually positively informing the work that we're doing and making it more likely that our messages are reaching them and are connecting with them. So thank you for doing that activity with me. Um, Luce, if I could have the slides back, that'd be so terrific. Um, and just while we're waiting for that to come in, um, we're gonna be talking about some basic foundations of, um, of youth leadership. And so some, some key concepts I wanna make sure we're starting with shared understanding from. Thank you so much. Um, and you can go to ahead probably. Yes, young people were in reciprocal relationships with them. The next one is okay, yeah, perfect, thank you. So when we're talking about foundations that we want to um, understand to build on top of youth leadership with, um, one of them is positive youth development. And some of you might be familiar with this already, but I'm gonna do a brief overview just in case we're not. And positive youth development is a framework uh, and an approach to how we work with youth that includes a lot of different concepts. But the bottom line is in the name, we want youth to, we wanna promote positive development in youth. Um, I think that this is also kind of a, a counterweight to um, approaches working with youth that might be patronizing or condescending or really fear-based. We're really afraid of all the bad things that can happen to young people. Whereas positive youth development encourage us, is a, encourages us to balance um, an understanding of um, the strengths and the uh, potential that our young people have, and also an awareness of the risk factors that they might be having, um, the, the things that we want to um, support them with, that we're, we're really reaching their holistic selves. We're not just approaching them from a silo of, we only talk to young people about healthy relationships. No, we, we acknowledge the full young person that's coming to us. So a couple components of positive youth development that I wanna talk about. Um, the first one is the context of their changing bodies, brains, and social roles. And we're specifically gonna talk about teenagers today because we're talking about teen dating violence. Um, and so some things that I want us to just be aware of that are happening in uh, teenagers, uh, time of puberty, um, with their bodies, puberty is sending a whole host of hormones coursing through their body. And if you can really put yourself back in your shoes of what it was like to be in high school or, and just watch your body change, feel these new feelings, be confused by what you're both feeling and seeing happening with your body, um, that that's a lot sometimes for young people. It's, it's overwhelming um, and they can be really, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Overwhelming is the word that I use. Um, but just to keep that in context that like when these hormones are coming through, it can cause mood swings, it can cause aggression. Um, and that can sometimes explain the reactions that we see from young people, um, the ways we see them interact with their peers. And just important context to remember, put yourself back into puberty and remember how intense it was. Um, the other impact of changing brains, there's two pieces I wanna talk about here because um, I'm not a brain scientist and I don't think any of us are, but we can still uh, learn some val valuable things about how the brain works. And the first is um, the prefrontal cortex. That's a tiny part of your brain. I don't know if it's tiny or not, but it's a piece of your brain. And what the prefrontal cortex is responsible for is mood regulation. So keeping you calm, keeping you stable, even when emotions are high. It's responsible for assessing long-term risk so saying, if I do A, not only what will B happen, but what will W, X, Y, Z happen all the way down the line. That kind of future-oriented thinking is something that that prefrontal cortex is responsible for. And it also helps you understand cause and effect. So understanding, oh, if I do X, then Y happens. If somebody does X, then Y happens. And that prefrontal cortex is not fully developed until 25. Um, and so it's important for us to remember that as we're seeing young people do things that we might think are irrational, that we think they don't have common sense, that their brain is not supporting them or encouraging them yet in um, those kind of things that would help them regulate their mood, um, that would help them understand long-term risk, but that we can help them grow those new neurons in that part of their brain that will strengthen it. Um, but we're not gonna do it by just, you know, uh, commenting about how immature they are or whatnot, that we have to support them along the way. And we'll talk about how, how youth leadership plays into that. The other impact of changing um, social roles is that one, young people are taking more ownership over their social spaces, their social circles. 
Whereas as a younger child, maybe parents had to help support them, you know, bring them to a friend's house or even introduce them to who their friends are in a church community or, you know, in whatever community. But young people are taking more ownership over, that's my friend, we hang out together, these are my peers. And at the same time, the, the perspective and opinions of their peers are carrying a lot of weight. It means a lot to them. And that's really important for us to think about in the work that we do with young people, because we can't just target individual young people. We have to target their peers as a whole. And if we want to engage their peers as a whole, we need youth leadership, because we're not going to be able to engage them all if we don't have that um, direct youth participation and leadership from them. Um, the other thing that's changing socially is that young people's moral codes are shifting at this time. In teenage dumb and adolescence, they're starting to see moral issues, not just in black and white and good and bad, but they're understanding the nuances and shades of gray when it comes to, to moral questions. And they're looking up at the world around them and seeing what's happening, and they're asking themselves, what's my role in this? When I see things happening, what's my part? Um, and again, that's a really prime time for us um, to provide them opportunities for youth leadership. So at the time that they're having those first kind of questions and urges, we're providing them opportunities where they can really shine and excel and show us the way. Another concept of positive youth development that I wanna talk about is making sure that we're engaging all youth and not just exceptional youth. Um, there's always gonna be those go-getters um, who are gonna sign up for our programs immediately when they see them, when there's an opportunity for them, they wanna engage in it. And that's awesome. We want to engage those young people. But if we're stopping with only those young people who self-select, who volunteer into our programs and kind of readily identify that they wanna participate, it's not enough. We wanna also engage young people who might not think that they're the kind of person who participates in these kinds of things, who maybe was frozen out of previous opportunities, who maybe is not always present at school, doesn't like school, um, is maybe not even going to school. Um, and so when we're, when we're thinking about the opportunities we're creating, we wanna assess what are the barriers for those young people? How are we making it easier for them to come into these spaces and not just engage in the young people who are like, yes, immediately I'm down, let's go. So all youth, not just the exceptional ones. And I wanna rephrase that, not just exceptional youth, but the, the youth who are most eager to volunteer is what I, I mean to say there. Um, another concept that I wanna talk about is community collaboration and a long-term commitment as a principle of positive youth development understanding that young people um, are not just students in school. They are not just um, you know, participants in after school program, that they move through many different spaces and that those spaces all provide the messages and values around relationships, around healthy communication, around dating. And so in order to meet young people's full selves, we have to meet their full community and engage them in all the spaces and places that they move. So that's sports, that's church, that is community centers, that is families and parents and guardians, that is their peers, that's like the block level of where they live. Um, and that when we engage in those wide community collaborations, we're both reaching young people in more spaces. And we're also developing relationships that are just gonna become networks of support around young people. And when we do this, it's not the kind of thing that after you identify, we wanna have these community partners. You can't build those relationships in just like one fiscal year. It's a long-term commitment to, to building trust, building um, communication and collaboration with those groups and organizations, and getting on the same page about what you all wanna do to support young people and the effort to end teen dating violence. And then I think the cornerstone of positive youth development is a strengths-based approach, which in my mind is both very simple and very, um, uh, like not simple, I think. It, it, it sounds like a very obvious thing, but it doesn't always show up in the work that we're doing. We kind of have to like really in, uh, intend that we're bringing it forward. And all that a strengths-based approach means is that we're not primarily coming to young people with, this is what you're at risk of, this is what you can do wrong, this is all the wrong that can happen to you, this is what trouble you're in, that we're instead leading with, you have so many strengths to bring to the table. You have a perspective and skills that we don't have you have so much opportunity and potential to, to be a leader and to bring positive change into your community, what support do you need in order to be able to do that? Um, and sometimes another way of thinking of this is thinking of protective factors and risk factors. Um, and so this is kind of the, the idea of the socio-ecological model that when we're engaging in violence prevention, we're engaging in the personal level, the interpersonal, the community level, and the societal level and that we can empower young people with protective factors, um, such as having trusting, loving adults in their lives, having opportunities for them to feel achievement and self-worth, 
um, providing a full uh, you know, array of uh, services and support for them. And that when we focus more on the protective factors that uh, promote resiliency in process, that provides them uh, a little bit of a buffer between risk factors. But again, we're leading with strengths and we're leading with protective factors rather than leading with risk factors and leading with a deficit-based approach. Um, so Lucy, you can move to the next slide. I also have a resource on positive youth development at the end of this, if that's a new uh, kind of framework for you all. Another foundational concept um, that we're gonna, um, we're gonna set is this concept of adultism and anti-oppression. Um, since one of the themes of this conference is, is bringing anti-oppression frameworks into our work as um, people who are working in domestic violence and teen dating violence. Um, adultism is, uh, the Merriam-Webster definition is prejudice or discrimination against young people as a group. Um, and this is sometimes not a concept that many people are as familiar with. It's something that we're still trying to have dialogue about and introduce to people. And it's kind of hard because there's a lot of dynamics in our society where um, young people can sometimes feel like there's this power imbalance between adults and young people, because there is. And sometimes they get questions like, you know, is it adultist that I'm forced to go to school? And I think that's an interesting question because there's this balance of, we know that school is important for young people and we want to make sure that they're there. But also they feel, well, you're forcing me to go to school. What if I don't feel like going to school? And so it's tricky to find that balance between what's a positive supportive relationship with adults and young people and what's adultist. Uh, we're, on the next slide, we're, we're gonna stay here for now, but on the next one, we'll, we'll talk more about what adultism looks like. But we, I think, understand what it is um, for, a, for an adult to, to judge a young person based on their age, to assume their skills or capacity based on their age, um, to make generalizations um, about their age range um, and have those become barriers that stop young people from excelling, from wanting to show up in spaces, from wanting to fully participate. And when we're thinking about adultism, we're thinking about it in the context of a wider anti-oppression framework that understands the ways that different types of oppression and discrimination can overlap. I think an example of this is if you're not familiar, there's about 30 states across the country um, with uh, primarily Republican controlled legislatures and they've introduced these bills that would prevent trans women from participating in women's athletics and trans men from participating in men's athletics. Um, and I think that this is, these bills represent both um, adultism, they represent transphobia and a little bit of racism as well. Um, because sometimes the, the examples that legislators have brought up when they're trying to defend these bills um, have racist caricatures of Black trans women. But th this is important for us to think about because when we are wanting to fully show up for young people, when we're wanting to, to engage in conversations with them and programming about healthy relationships, we need to understand all these ways that uh, oppressive structures can negatively harm young people. Um, so Lucy, if we can move to the next slide. Um, there we go. All right, so on the screen right now, there's a visual and it is of a boat that is approaching an iceberg. And this iceberg has two labels that are above the water and two labels that are beneath the water. And so from top to bottom, they read internalized, interpersonal, institutional, and ideological. And this is a way of thinking of how oppression or oppressive structures show up in many different spaces from the internalized, what we think, to the ideological things that kind of our society thinks together. And I wanna put these in practice for adultism so we understand what this looks like in practice. So internalized adultism is when young people themselves internalize adultist ideas and thoughts. And so I would see this in the classroom with young people when I, when I would come and say like, you know, we're gonna be talking about healthy relationships and what it means to be a good partner um, or a good person that you're in a relationship with. And they would say, no, you know, we're just too immature for that. We can't take conversations like that seriously. Um, this idea that they've heard from adults so often that they've started to repeat themselves. And when you think that you can't, uh, when, when you think that people your age are not capable of healthy relationships, it lowers the bar, the expectation that young people deserve to be in healthy relationships. On an interpersonal level, the ways that adults work with young people and interact with them, some adultist things that I've heard is just because I said so, um, making a decision that impacts a young person and not explaining why that adult made it. Um, and just expect that because they're the adult and the other young person is young, that's just how it is because I said so. Even when young people are curious for the reasoning behind decisions and even wanna provide their own feedback and input. 
Another thing that we kind of more demonstrate and less say overtly is do how I say, not how I do. So setting examples or expectations for youth that we don't even take ourselves or that we knew that we didn't take at our age and are not acknowledging um, the context that might stop a young person from um, taking our advice or, or the, the whatever we're trying to share with them. Um, just generally things I've heard about youth relationships, that's just puppy love, that's not real, that's not serious, that'll end in two weeks. Hearing that abuse has happened in a young person's relationship and saying, well, what did you expect? You were too young, you didn't know what you're getting into. And then again, that does not set up young people to have the expectation that they can be in happy, healthy relationships. On an institutional level, how this shows up in uh, organizations in schools and nonprofits and kind of institutional structures is not respecting confidentiality. When a young person talks about violence or harm they've experienced in a relationship, there are some adults who confuse their mandated reporter status and the rights that young people have under confidentiality. And that changes state to state, but in Illinois, there are a great deal of confidentiality protections that young people have. And so I've had students who were you know, aware that they were in an unhealthy relationship, they were gonna wanna do something about it, they were ready to have a conversation with their partner to set new boundaries. And when an adult made a decision for them to report what was happening, the whole school got involved. Suddenly those students were forced to separate themselves. They couldn't handle the conflict that they were having on their own. Um, and the young people or the young person, I'm, I'm thinking of a very specific situation, felt very betrayed by that. And that's an example of institutional adultism. It took the ownership out of that situation out of the young person's hands, um, even when it wasn't required by law. Um, making decisions that impact young people without their input or leadership. So, you know, having uh, programming within a nonprofit that youth didn't directly provide feedback and input to shape. Um, making a decision about what they're forced to participate in at school without them getting to decide if it's what they wanna learn about. Um, and I think on a, a kind of larger institutional level, the school to prison pipeline is again, one of those situations where there's both adultism and racism happening and sometimes also sexism and transphobia that when we have a society that has punitive structures in schools that overly punish black and brown youth, um, that sometimes have police in schools that are directly like arresting young people for things that should not be handled by police, that that school to prison pipeline itself represents adultism as well as many other types of oppression. On an ideological level, the, the way that we kind of think about adultism and it just, in, it, uh, it's in the water that we swim in, we don't even notice it. These thoughts or expectations we have sometimes that young people are liability, they need to be controlled, they can't handle responsibility, and therefore they need adults to be the ones who make decisions for them or to influence what happens in their lives. And so when we're confronting adultism, we're wanting to see how it shows up at all these levels and how we can push up against that in the work that we do. Luz, we can move to the next slide. So um, just to close this conversation um, about adultism and uh, anti-oppression frameworks, this is a visual of a bicycle wheel and there are spokes that radiate from the center. And at the end of these spokes are words like sexism, racism, homophobia, classism, ableism, et cetera. And to me, this is a visual that shows how different types of oppression collaborate with each other and they lean on each other. And so when we really step into this work meaningfully and say, we wanna confront adultism, we're trying to snip that spoke of the wheel and that makes the rest of the wheel weaker. And then if we also come in and say, we also want to confront and challenge other types of oppression, these other spokes, that when we snip them and when we weaken them all together, the wheel eventually can't keep turning and it collapses. So I think that's just a visual to show us the ways in which different types of oppression can collaborate with each other, which um, is something for us to be um, wanting to push up against. The, the benefit there is that when we take this approach, if we're, if we're coming at this and uh, trying to snip away multiple spokes, we can actually increase our efficacy um, or our ability to challenge oppression in the different spaces and places that we move through. We can move to the next slide, Luz. Um, I'm gonna just pause for questions because I just gave you all a lot of information. We're gonna have a, a conversation after this that's gonna be a little bit more engaging with all of us, but um, I wanna just see if there's any questions after all that we learned. And if there's not, I'm down to just hold a little bit of um, silence has some transition time so we can sit and absorb thoughts. If you have questions, you're welcome to put them in the chat or to um, hop on audio, either way. 
or we can just rest for a little bit. All right, well then let's get into a conversation together. You can go to the next slide, Luz. All right, um, and you can actually stop screen sharing for a little bit so we can all see each other if that's what we want. Um, I just wanna open the floor to everybody. Um, we have about 10 minutes to have this conversation. And I wanna ask you all, why is youth leadership um, important um, in the work that we do against teen dating violence? And what positive models have you seen um, that promote youth leadership? What ways have you seen other organizations providing opportunities for young people to lead in the efforts to end teen dating violence? Um, I can jump in. I always love to highlight an organization that I feel like I've learned a lot from, um, the Idaho Coalition. Um, they came and spoke at the Illinois um, Coalition Against Sexual Assault Conference a few years back and talked about their youth advisory committee um, and how they bring in youth to advise. And that was just something I had never thought of as a preventionist, I feel terrible that I had not thought about that, but um, that really started us thinking about how that could be important for our work, um, as well as uh, they pay their youth to be a part of that. So they pay their youth for their um, contributions um, and, and, and involve youth just in every level. And um, I believe they had some of their youth who wrote an open letter after the confirmation of Brett Kavanaugh um, that got a lot of national attention because we're hearing from youth. So, um, I think on the one hand, it allows us to learn, like you were saying, from youth and also just allows better youth buy-in because they they don't feel like it's me, a dinosaur, telling them um, what I think they need to know. They, uh, they're they hearing from each other. And I think that peer policing is just so much more um, effective than me telling them, this is what you shouldn't do, don't do that, don't do that. Um, when they're they're getting that, um, that push to worry about peer approval and, and social capital, um, that's much more likely to impact their choices and decisions. So um, I think I, I think that's just, that's how prevention has to go is involving youth on a deeper level. Absolutely. Um, that's a great point, Katie. Let me put these questions in the chat so I can share for everybody. Um, just one second while I type that out. So why is youth leadership important in our efforts against teen dating violence? What positive models have you seen where youth have been centered as leaders? Um, just one quick thing, um, Linnea, that, that I, I love that uh, those models of a youth advisory committee, having youth write a letter um, about the, the Brett Kavanaugh confirmation. Um, you talked about the benefits there, you know, people paid more attention. Um, just like one quick thing is maybe, um, you know, when we're talking about like what that does, I think a better way to describe like, instead of youth policing is like, um, peer accountability, that when they see other youth involved in this efforts, um, when they see that other people their age care about ending violence, they feel accountable to that. And that's a really powerful, strong emotion that they want to step into. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, if anyone else wants to hop off audio, it would be awesome if you also want to just introduce yourself um, and say your name um, and maybe where you're coming from and your pronouns. You want to go for it, Katie? Hi, everybody. Um, <clears throat> my name is Katie and my pronouns are she, they. Um, I come from Erie Neighborhood House, um, and I'm a youth. Hi, you actually look familiar, Levi, and I don't know why. <laughs> My roommate works at, at Erie Neighborhood House, so I've been in and out sometimes. Oh, who's your roommate? Wait, it's okay if you don't want to share that. <laughs> we'll talk another time. Okay. Um, but I'm a youth program coordinator, and I spend like 30 hours a week with teenagers. Um, and an example of youth leadership that I thought was really empowering was they got to hire me. So the youth ambassadors, um, like the previous person had shared, there's an opportunity to get paid to do this work um, within Erie House with the teenagers and they were there for the hiring process. So they could, they could be the person that picks out the person who advocates for their programs. Um, and I thought that was incredible because it's like, yeah, the youth should have agency in deciding who they're about to spend a whole bunch of time with, who has power in making decisions with them. Um, and it was so astonishing to me that I haven't seen that in all the other nonprofit spaces I've been in, which have all been youth focused. Um, but to answer the first question, 
Um, I think it's important in breaking a really nasty pattern of expectations. I think there's the adultist view of um, adults being really uh, angry and frustrated that teens um, are mischievous or irresponsible. And then when teens do that, adults are mad that they didn't. And that's just such an ugly pattern. How, how do you expect people to know how to advocate for themselves and their emotions if you didn't give them the opportunity to learn those practices and the space to feel safe in those practices in the first place? Um, so I, I think it's very preventative to support kids and teens in their own agency of their feelings and their ideas and their identities. Um, so it's a smoother time for them to advocate for themselves throughout their whole life um, in validating their own feelings and in, in, in who they are. If I wasn't mute, uh, if I wasn't muted when you were sharing that, Katie, you would have just heard like snaps all the way, all the way around. Um, so something you said there is having young people participate in the hiring process. And I think that's such a great example of youth leadership because it's not, oh, what's the cute little program that we can have where the young people choose the pizza that we'll order for the party? It's like, well, at our agency, a, a, a type of power that adults have is they decide who gets hired. They get to decide who gets to, you know, join the organization, engage in the work. Um, so if that's the type of power adults have, let's give it to the young people too. And you describe because it impacts them, it's going to impact their programming. That kind of collaboration makes sense. Um, so thank you for sharing that, Katie. Um, I want to read some things from the chat and then I'll let other folks hop on audio, but I just want to share that Rose said the organization Take Back the Halls in Chicago educates youth about teen dating violence and culminates in the class creating their own community-based project to address an aspect of it. Love it. There's a partnership there. Adults came with a curriculum. They wanted to share some things with youth, but then they asked what community-based project do you want to do and let it put it in their own hands. Um, somebody else said, I've also heard of agencies offering a stipend for youth to develop content surrounding teen dating violence on TikTok. You'd have to know uh, based on talking to young people, um, you know, I'm not on TikTok, but I do love watching some compilation videos sometimes. There's some really questionable messages there around gender roles, around dating, um, that you know, if you hear from young people that that's happening, you can then provide them an opportunity to provide counter stories, to provide counterpoints against that. Um, anybody else wanna hop on audio and share um, why is uh, youth leadership important in teen dating violence, uh, our efforts against it, and what positive models have you seen? Hi everyone, my name is Annabelle. I'm with the network. I'm actually looking into other positive models. Um, so uh, the network has a youth advisory committee. And so it's a group of 16 young leaders. Um, I've been so lucky to work with them. I mean, these most of these leaders, they care so much about other so social justice issues. So like, let's say some of them have their own clothing drive or food drives, or, you know, they do so much in their community already. Um, and so we meet monthly and they do receive stipends um, and they, um, let's say they do, they, they do trainings. We, you know, I give them the space or like, I, I guess we sort of like co-facilitate, you know? Um, and I mean, they're just great. I mean, they're just these great leaders. And yes, I, I feel like, you know, they um, they need to sometimes um, remember that they, they, they do have already these skills or, you know, um, even though they're young and they was part, sometimes I guess they don't hear it enough, you know, but I feel like at least in these, in this committee, they are given that space. Um, and for example, in February, we had a teen dating violence panel that was, you know, it was their idea. They chose um, the panelists, two of our um, committee members, they are survivors and they wanted to be part of this panel. Um, and so, so, I mean, I love working with them. I love their energy. Um, yeah, but I would love to know more also like about how I can, you know, help them grow. Thank you so much. Well, so and so my emoji that I have or like in my picture, it's from them, you know, so they're like more into like, um, yeah, like using, um, using emojis or, you know, whatever from like Snapchat or whatever. So I'm like, okay, I like if they, that's what they use, I'm gonna use that as well, you know, it is like you said, like playful. Absolutely. So much goodness there. Um, Annabelle, it's good to see you again, too. I haven't been able to see you in person in a while. But um, yeah, the network, I think, is such a great example. They have a youth advisory board. Um, and actually, pre-COVID, I was able to attend one of their teen dating violence events um, 
two years ago, I think. And it was so cool to see how they ran the show and how they got to make all these decisions. And it was such a great event. We had so many community organizations come together. There was art making stations, there was food, there was music, there was dancing, there was poetry performances. And it was just a really great night. And I think an example of the power of youth leadership. Um, you said something there that I really loved, which is youth already have these skills. Like you said, they're so passionate about showing up in the world and creating change in their communities. They often have these skills of engaging with their peers. What they don't have is the resources, which we often have as people who work at nonprofits and organizations. So when we can connect their skills to resources and opportunities to practice those skills, that's where the, the, the collaboration can really begin. Any last minute comments before we move into our next section? I wanna share one more example, just because I know the, the theme of this conference is decarcerating domestic violence work. Um, and I think a lot of, a person who a lot of people have probably been talking about is Miriam Kaba, um, who's a really great abolitionist. Um, ooh, what words to describe her? She does a lot of different work. Um, but um, one project that really sticks out in my mind is um, the Rogers Park, uh, what was it? The Rogers Park Youth Women Action Task Force, I wanna say. Um, and so, Rogers Park um, created this task force um, that was primarily engaging Black women, Black young girls, um, and asking them what their experiences around sexual harassment were, what their experiences around teen dating violence were, and then really taught them about how to be community organizers, not just engaging um, other girls, but engaging their, their male peers, engaging adults in the community. Um, and they just did a lot of really wonderful research together. They had young people doing research. They had them creating awareness campaigns. They had them doing marches through the community and uh, promoting messages against uh, sexual harassment. Um, and their model, I think, just really centered young people all the steps along the way. And Miriam Cabo was very clear that she was an adult ally in that process, that she was there to, to answer questions, to provide resources, but that the young people were steering themselves. Um, so I'll put that name in the chat in case you want to read more about them. Rogers Park Youth Women Action Task Force. Um, they are no longer active, um, but you can still find their website, which they've held as kind of a, an archival resource for the community. Okay, so um, Luce, if I can have the slides back, we're going to um, go back into a little bit of a presentation um, and then we're going to have another conversation um, afterward. Um, and so while we're waiting for this um, slide to pop up, um, there's going to be a visual and this is a, a, a tool that's called Roger Hart's Youth Leadership, or no, I'm sorry, Roger Hart's Ladder of Youth Participation. That's the name of the, the person who made it. Um, and the visual is going to be a ladder. We can see it now. And there's eight rungs on this ladder and the bottom three are in red and then the top five are in blue. And I would love if we could get some volunteers um, to start from the bottom and just read these. Uh, we'll have each person read two rungs um, and just feel free to volunteer after you hear someone stop reading, just hop in, unmute your mic and read them. Um, so starting with rung one, manipulation, I would love if somebody could read those first two and then we'll just have people hop in and read the rest. So rung one, manipulation, adult-led activities in which youth do as directed without understanding of the purpose or the activity. And then rung two, decoration, adult-led activities in which youth understand purpose but have no input in how they are planned. Thank you, Mary Beth. Can I actually get someone to just read the third one and we'll pause there. Round three, tokenism, adult-led activities in which youths may be consulted with minimal opportunities for feedback. Awesome, thank you, Jimena. Um, so these first three rungs, manipulation, decoration, and tokenism, why do you all think these are in red? It seems like it might not be the best rungs on the ladder. What do you think is happening within these ways of youth participating that are not super great? What do you think? Again, you can answer in the chat or on audio, whatever feels comfiest. Hillary said, adults assume they know what is best. 
Elle said they don't really have autonomy in these three situations. Yeah, I think that really captures it. These first three rungs are adults setting the terms and then deciding how much they want young people to be involved. So to give some examples, manipulation, adult-led activities in which youth do as directed without understanding the purpose of the activities, having youth take a survey and then not saying what that survey will be used for, um, or what the implications of having this like great wealth of data and information, um, what that does. Um, you know, having youth choose the pizza topping, you know, for, for an after school party and having no idea what the rest of the event is about. They just were allowed to make this one decision. It's kind of manipulating. You're, you're extracting this youth participation, but not connecting it to the real significance of the work. With decoration, um, youth do understand the purpose of the event, but they don't have any input in how it's planned. So the adults are saying, we're planning this after school event. It's going to be so good. You're going to love it. Meet you there. That's just the youth are there, their decoration. They're not participating meaningfully in any way. They're just there to do whatever. Tokenism, that's in which um, the adult, the, the youth are consulted, they're asked questions, but then there's very minimal opportunities. Um, you know, you might ask, um, how should we promote this event? Um, is, is, uh, is, is posters in the hallway a good way to promote this event? Is social media a good way to promote this event? But then not asking them, how should we do outreach? Do you wanna help us do that outreach? What do you think we need to do in order to, to get other people your age to come to this? So these three, um, the, the, the fact that young people don't have the autonomy there, that's the important part. Adults are setting the terms and it, it feels and it looks like young people are involved, but there's not real leadership there. Um, and then we can go all the way up the ladder for these next ones. So if somebody wants to volunteer to read um, the next two. Rung four says, assign but informed, adult-led activities in which youth understand purpose, decision-making process, and have a role. Rung five, consulted and informed, adult-led activities in which youth are consulted and informed about how their input will be used in the outcome of adult decisions. Thank you, Linnea. Next two. Rung six, adult initiated shared decisions with youth, adult led activities in which decision making is shared with youth. And rung seven, youth initiated and directed youth led activities with little input from adults. Awesome. And then just last rung. Wrong eight, youth initiated shared decisions with adults, youth led activities in which decision making is shared between youth and adults working as an equal partners. Awesome, thank you, Jimena. So these next runs are in blue because um, even run four is actually providing an opportunity for youth leadership. That one is uh, made unique because young people are assigned roles um, but they are informed about like what those roles mean, the significance, the importance, their flexibility, but they're still assigned a role. You don't get to self-identify what they want to do. Um, but all of these rungs do start to incorporate more elements of youth leadership. Youth make decisions. They shape the, the scope or the purpose of an activity or a program or an event, whatever it is. Um, and that as we're going higher and higher on these rungs, youth are taking more agency and more autonomy. And when we get to the seventh and eighth rung, um, it's not to say that the eighth rung is the best type of thing. This, this ladder, even though it looks hierarchical, is not to say that rung eight is the best one, but it is the one in which young people are taking the most agency. It's youth-led activities, decision-making is shared between youth and adults, but they're equal partners. Um, actually, I'm sorry, rung seven actually is the one where young people have the most uh, like autonomy because they're the ones leading activities and adults have little input. Rung eight is where adults and young people are collaborating on equal footing. Um, and so when we're thinking about these, this is a good visual to assess where are we at with our programs right now? To think about the work that we do with young people, is it like rung two right now? Is it actually youth leadership or is it decoration? Is it actually youth leadership or is it tokenism? And then to ask ourselves, you know, maybe we're at this rung, what would it take for that partnership of youth leadership to actually move up a couple of rungs? Um, so again, this is not prescribing that rung eight is the best one all the time, but it's a good thing to think about, to imagine what would that require? What would that take? Um, we can move to the next slide real quick. So some considerations, um, 
I'm sorry, that's a wrong title. It says examples of youth, but it should say considerations. Um, that's okay. Um, so one thing to keep in mind is that not all youth are ready for these high rungs. Actually, Lucy, you might be able to go to four with one slide. Is that the right one? That is the right one. Okay, thank you. Um, so considerations for, for using this model for thinking about youth leadership. Not all youth are gonna be ready to take that high level of responsibility and programming. That's why we don't wanna just go to rung eight right away. It might be really good to, to assess and understand we're actually at rung four right now, but we really want our young people to be able to move up a couple of steps on that ladder. And what would that take? It's often gonna take mentorship and peer support. So having a community that says, you are capable of doing this. We know that you can do this. We know that you have unique skills that you could bring to this table. What support do you need to be able to take this on? We also wanna think about barriers to participating. So um, a big one is money. <laughs> If we're asking adults to do labor for an organization and to, to take on work, to do something, they get paid for that. Um, it's not just that young people love to volunteer. It's not that they love to work without compensation. And it's that we often don't think that they deserve it. Um, and this is hard with nonprofits. I'm going to acknowledge that. Not all of us have expansive budgets where we can endlessly kind of pull money for youth stipends. But if you want youth to show up at something, money talks and putting your money where your mouth is shows them that you're committed and that you value youth leadership so much that you're actually going to compensate it in the same way that it's perfectly acceptable to spend $5,000 um, or however much money on an employee salary to validate the work that they're bringing to the organization. You also wanna validate that work that young people are, are providing. Um, so if it's feasible, uh, stipends are great. And if it's not, you can think of other ways to try to incentivate, incentivize and compensate youth for their leadership. Um, a great way to make sure that young people come to these opportunities, come to youth advisory board meetings, come to after school programs is food and fun. So really thinking about, you know, if you want young people to come, you better feed them. They're going to want food. Um, and that also thinking about, you know, we don't want to just get down to business during whatever we want to do. We want to have fun together. We want to build community. We want to build and model the healthy relationships we want them to carry out. And that to get them to, to come to whatever it is you're trying to get them to come to, you need youth-led outreach. If you're just thinking about like, well, I think if we have posters at this place, young people might see it. And I think if we do whatever on social media, they might see it. If you have young people who are already engaged, maybe they're the first four to sign up for your youth leadership, you know, whatever it is, ask them, what do we need to do to get more of people your age to this table? So not just stopping once you, you, you've done the, the, the people who immediately showed up, but ask, how do we get more people to come into this space? and having youth help lead the outreach in that effort. A big thing to consider is that when you're building spaces for youth leadership, you're not just um, teaching young people about how to work in structures that adults know how to navigate, you're teaching adults how to restructure their work to be more accommodating to young people. So an example of this is, you know, I've seen some places that invite youth advisory board members to their organization's board of director meetings or whatnot. But if you just have them come and it's the same meeting and the same kind of like traditional, very formal way that the minutes are read and the agenda is carried out and people have a very like formal high level discussion and there's no gains, there's no getting to know you activities, that does not promote youth leadership. That does not promote them to wanna to engage in that. So asking yourself, what might we have to restructure on the adult's end to make this a more welcoming space for youth? That board of directors example is just an example, but you can imagine how you might need to restructure some other things in your agency to make it more welcoming and accessible to young people. Um, throughout all of that, it takes time to build trust and relationships. So not being disappointed when your, your efforts aren't immediately working, but building in that, 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 that um, long-term process, emphasizing that we're gonna start every space that we engage in youth with by building community agreements so that this feels like a community by having them help shape the space that they're in. If you're meeting in a space, whether it's virtual or physical, having the young people help decorate that space, make it a place they wanna hang out, make it a place that they feel safe in. Um, and that, you know, the more that you take that time to build trust and relationships, the more they're gonna to wanna to keep showing up and bringing their skills and their leadership. Um, we'll talk more about this later, but not keeping youth leadership into the one department that, you know, at the domestic violence agency, there's only youth leadership in the stuff around curriculum or around after school activities. There can be youth leadership that informs how you do counseling. There can be youth leadership that informs how you do court advocacy. There can be youth leadership that determines how you do public awareness campaigns. And that that actually increases um, the, uh, 
that improves those programs. Even if they previously didn't have youth in them, now they do, and that can only be positive. And when you're working with youth, I think it's really important to be honest about your organization's constraints. Um, so don't tell young people that, you know, this, the sky's the limit. We can do anything you want to do. If you know that you're working with a limited budget, just be upfront about that. If you know that there's certain kinds of decisions that the powers that be in your organization are not going to approve, be honest about that. And then help the young people understand how you can either work with those obstacles or how you can work around them so that they don't feel, you know, blindsided or let me rephrase that. So they don't feel um, caught off guard. Um, or betrayed if something happens, but they were aware of it. And that actually they had to take on new leadership skills to ask, how can we get past this problem? So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take five minutes. Luce, you can go to the next slide. Um, and I'm gonna put these questions in the chat. We're just gonna take five minutes of silent reflection. Um, we can skip this slide actually. Um, for sake of time, I have to cut this, but if you wanna go back um, afterwards, um, we'll keep talking about benefits of youth leadership on youth and adults. I think we've touched on it already, but if you want to get into more detail, you can go to that slide on your own time. So we're going to do five minutes of quiet reflection. I'm going to put these comments in the chat. What does your organization do currently to engage youth? Make a list of all the ways youth interact with or are involved in your work. So just kind of do like a assessment or an audit, however you want to frame it, and think about wherever in your organization you see young people. Maybe they are recipients of counseling. Maybe they're recipients of prevention education. Maybe you already have youth leadership uh, in your organization, but make a list of all those different ways that youth come up or come into your work. Um, and then after the five minutes, we're going to go into a breakout group, and then we're going to have conversations about what we talked about. So I'm setting a timer here. I'm gonna take some time off camera, um, but I'll join you all back in five minutes.
Just a heads up, we'll be closing this reflection in about a minute. All right, everybody, so we can come back together. Um, and we are gonna do a share back after the breakout room. So I'm gonna be very excited to hear what you all wrote about. But now we're gonna go into breakout rooms and to pairs of two or groups of three. And I'm gonna put the questions in the chat that we're gonna be discussing. And we're just gonna chat about these practices and share which rung of the ladder you think it falls on. Do others in your room agree? Oops. How could you move this practice to a higher run and what might be in your way? So that's what we're gonna be talking about in our breakout rooms for 10 minutes. And when we come back, um, we're gonna share back what we learned um, and what we talked about. And then we're gonna go over some other kinds of models or structures that promote youth leadership. So um, if you're still feeling like you wanna know some more examples, don't worry, examples are coming. Um, I'm going to send the breakout room notifications now, um, and we're going to have 10 minutes in this breakout. Oh, Lucy, you already got it. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to be popping into different people's breakout rooms. So if you see me come in, don't stop your conversation. I'm just listening in. Um, and if you have any questions, um, feel free to send a message to the main room, and I'll find it and try to, to visit you all if you're needing support. So enjoy your breakouts. Kale or Luce, I'm having trouble figuring out how to hop into a breakout room. I think I missed my message when it was given to me. Is there a way that y'all can reassign that? Yeah, let me see. Just pop me in a random one. Thank you. All right, Hillary maybe stepped away, but I don't know if you're there or not. That happens. Hi, Kale, how are you doing? Hey, I'm doing all right. I'm uh, sitting here monitoring things with my dog Petunia on my lap, so that's pretty good. <laughs> how are Petunia, you? that's so cute. <laughs> yeah, she's the best. I love that name. Um, I'm doing good, I'm doing good, I'm multitasking. <laughs> making some food um so I was gonna say totally chill for lunch all right you're literally just gonna play music and if anyone pops in I'm sure you'll notice okay. but um yeah we, we only got well Laura and then someone else yesterday okay yeah that's pretty small I was uh thinking I might like type in the chat before I get out of this session just to say like hey y'all if you want to join us at lunch you're welcome to it'll be chill but if yeah see that's okay say just like free music or whatever I don't know whatever you want to say yeah yeah I am excited DJ about Kale on the mix <laughs> 
yeah i think it'll be cool nonetheless i i think i'm enjoying uh making the playlist so even if people don't show i like my playlist so <laughs> yeah 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 i love it i love it all right Levi, do you need to go to the next room? Yeah, sorry. I thought there was going to be a way for me able to do it, but if you want to put me on another one, that'd be great. Here, let me see. Do you have access now? Let me see. Um... You don't see like the breakout rooms in the bottom? I see breakout rooms. When I pull it up, it shows me like who's in every group. I don't see a way to like put myself in it. Um, but if you're able oh. to do it, that would be awesome. I I don't have access anymore. Let me see. Oh, okay. That's no worries if not. There should be a way to get you to just go into a room. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if, let me click some buttons. I'll see what magic I can do. <laughs> okay, sorry. No, no, it's fine. Oh, I did find it. Now I know.
Welcome back, everybody. I'm just going to wait for the rest of our friends. Woo, it's a real party now. Everyone's back. Thank you, everybody, for your participation in those breakout rooms. I was able to bop into a couple different places and heard some really great conversations being had, some really great ideas being shared. Um, we do not have as much time as I thought we would have, but that's totally okay. We're still going to uh, get through the rest of our, our session today without rushing. I would love to hear from one or two people about just something that's sticking with you from that conversation, a practice that you learned that you're thinking about, something that you're thinking about newly in terms of how your organization engages youth, just any general thoughts from those conversations. If we can get one or two people to share, either via the chat or audio. And if you want to introduce your name and pronouns um, when you start talking. Hi, um, I'm Amanda Woolsey. My pronouns are um, she and hers. And I just wanted to point out, like, thank you so much for this conversation, because uh, even me, me and my, the participant in the room, we were talking about how um, we need, we're like checking ourselves a lot. We're like, wow, I work with youth at a university. Um, well, I should say they're young adults, but um, some of them are teenagers, right? And um, I really, I feel like sometimes I'm just checking off a box, like, oh, I included them in this. Um, and that was such a good point that you made that um, of like, don't just give them, like, don't give them basically like, I'm sorry if I'm stumbling over my words. Uh, so I'm just basically saying like, we sometimes just give them an assignment. They do it rather than giving them agency over it. And that was like super important for me to hear. So I just want to thank you um, and everybody like joining in this conversation because I feel like it made me realize a lot about how I need to check myself and realize that. I think that I know everything, but I'm not a youth in that particular community in that particular setting. And I need to give them more agency because they know more than me um, and they're going through it at that time. So I just want to thank you for that. That's that's all the comments I wanted to make. Amanda, I want to thank you for that vulnerability. Um, that's a really great place to start from is just, that, that's why we do these assessments to just not be hard on ourselves, but just understand where our organizations are at, where we personally are at, um, and then step into this opportunity to think newly about the work that we're doing. So I really want to thank you for sharing that. Um, Linnea had shared in the chat, we talked about the difficulty of helping funders, leaders, and staff understand how data, tracking, hours of service um, will look different as you work to build those coalitions of youth partnership. So maybe there needs to be some board trainings. Maybe there needs to be some staff trainings where you really lay out in the work that we do, we're really committed to, to uh, combating teen dating violence. And it is so that work is so important to us that we are making a commitment to center youth. And this is the funding that's going to take. This is the commitment that's going to take. This is the flexibility that's going to take. And will you join us in that? So thank you for acknowledging that's an absolute barrier. Um, but there's some creative ways we can try to get buy in from other people in our organizations for that. Um, maybe one more thought uh, shared on audio if anybody would like to volunteer. Well, I just wanted to mention this um, Jimena from um, she, her, hers as pronouns. And just, it was a really quick, I mean, it was a really good check-in of like, you know, what is, what are our services and, you know, how it, how our program is structured? Um, you know, who, who would like our services, are, are they really available to, you know, to youth? Um, are we prepared, our counselors, our court advocates, our staff prepared to be able to work with youth? Um, and I think 
of course not. We have not even involved youth into policies, into what do you think about you know, this curriculum? What do you think about our policies and procedures? Um, we, we have not done that. And I, um, I do appreciate that you mentioned it. this is not a, you know, like a really, you know, quick change or, um, you know, or, or we, we should see results right away. It, it's going to take some time to, you know, to be able to organize and create that structure and, um, and, you know, and, and working with those limitations that we've had with when, when it comes to funding, when it comes to, you know, um, educating our, our funders on why they should be, you know, supporting our, um, or giving us the opportunity to use the funds how we believe it's best for our, for our community. Um, I think that's, that, that's a big one. And um, we, we also talked about, um, there's so many of you that are wanting to get involved in, in, in you know, in, in supporting organizations and, you know, in our community. I think it's, you know, a matter of, um, of really getting ready of how can we collaborate with each other and let them tell us, you know, what, how can we best support them? Um, instead of just doing awareness on teen dating violence and presentations, yes, it's important on the awareness, but I think we should definitely be thinking beyond that and, you know, and start asking those questions to ourselves and how can we again um, get our teens into this, you know, this, into helping us doing decision making when curriculums and policies. Thank you so much for that, Jimena. Um, Luz, are you able to pull the slides back up just while we're transitioning? Um, yeah, I mean, all of these are such good thoughts. I just want to thank you all for just being earnest about, you know, the places your organizations are coming from, the, the difficulty that's going to be ahead. This is not work that happens overnight. This is work that we set on the horizon and we keep trying to work towards. Right there's perfect, thank you. Um, so there's plenty of time to try to, to sit with this and reflect on what new commitments we can make, what new um, structures we can offer, both inside our organizations and in the community. I think that's important to think about. Like, um, This isn't just to increase our, our organization services and whatnot, but there's also ways we can collaborate with other agencies to create youth leadership structures in the community, not attached to a specific formal organization. Um, I want to make sure I, I, I leave giving you all some ideas of other places you can reflect on, and I'm going to really try to make sure we have time for at least one or two questions. Um, where can youth lead? They can lead not just during February and Teen Dating Violence Awareness Month. That's, of course, a great place to smart, start. I'm not making fun of it or anything. Um, the best events that I've seen happen have sometimes been during Teen Dating Violence Awareness Month. And that's a really great place to start because it's a short term goal. There's a, a goal of some event or some uh, awareness campaign and that that can actually be a starting point. You can get buy in to start with February and Teen Day Violence Awareness Month and then move it into a year long commitment. We've talked about youth advisory boards. I'm including resources at the end of this PowerPoint presentation. And on the Padlet, there's a resource that was actually made by youth from a youth advisory board at an organization called Maine Boys to Men. Um, they're an organization that I work with, and they have a tip sheet on how you can build um, really accessible youth advisory boards. Um, and to remember that youth advisory boards should have real decision making power at your agency, whatever power your board of directors has, um, you know, you can't, you can't give all the, the types of power, but it, not just have it be a, a cosmetic or a visual kind of thing, but that these young people on the youth advisory board are actually advising the agency on decisions it makes. Having youth um, have opportunities to public speak and plan events, to share their experiences, to advocate for policy, to speak in front of other community groups, um, have, helping you assess the evaluations and progress monitoring that you do. One of the best ideas that I've seen for evaluations came from a young person, which was like, you know, these surveys always have numbers on them. Like, are you most likely, are you least likely? Um, and they had the idea to use emojis instead to like say, how did you like today's program based on an emoji scale? And that was like way more likely that youth were actually going to fill that out because it was quick. They knew what those emojis meant. They didn't have to think about numbers and I don't know, is a seven better than a six, whatever. So helping you uh, make sure that when you're assessing and doing progress monitoring, that you're doing it in ways that young people actually want to respond to and share their feedback in meaningful ways. It might look more like focus groups and less like a survey. You got to ask them helping you um, structure and shape your physical spaces and youth spaces where they gather. So if you have counseling, maybe there needs to be a specific teen counseling room or a youth counseling room. And maybe instead of like a formal desk and a chair, it has bean bags and maybe it has fidgety toys. Um, 
or whatever space you have youth people, youth gathering in, can they make art to put in the space? Can you have a chalk wall so that they can like really just like be messy and draw whatever they want? Um, we've talked about community events, um, but asking them like, what other organizations do you trust and do you like? Maybe it's the library. Maybe it is like a music space. Maybe it is a restaurant, but asking them what other groups should we be collaborating with? What's a group that you think would be a good um, person to, or a group, a group to bring to the table to talk about this event or this partnership? Assessing your curriculum specifically around teen dating violence and making sure it's up to date. <laughs> Because I've seen some old teen dating violence curriculums that talk about like pagers. <laughs> so helping make sure that the examples you're using are relevant, um, that you're not just talking about stuff that was true in the 90s, maybe the last time a young person evaluated the curriculum, but that it's up to date today. Um, asking is, it, is intake, when we ask like what support you need for counseling or for core advocacy, is it a scary process? Is there a way that that could be more welcoming, that you would actually want to answer those questions and be vulnerable and be more likely to receive services? Supporting with public awareness campaigns and being the face of those public awareness campaigns, having them be the leaders in their school community, their actual communities that are promoting messaging about um, uh, ending harmful gender roles, advancing um, healthy relationships and equality, and social media. I think that just speaks for itself. They know how that works. They know how to reach their peers on social media. So help them help you create content for your organization um, to engage young people on your platforms. And then somebody had shared this earlier and I just, I think it's true. Uh, involve them in the hiring process, show what it looks like to hire an adult at the agency and maybe seeing that behind the scenes look makes them want to apply for other stuff in the future when they're able to. Or you can ask yourself, are we able to hire young people ourselves? Can we create part-time positions for 16 year olds? You gotta be careful with you know uh, employment law and whatnot, but we talked about stipends. You can have part-time youth employment, paid internships. Um, especially paid internships and not unpaid internships if possible. Because um, what that does is it creates a pipeline, a positive pipeline into your organization that what if there was a way that a young person could go from being a participant in your programming to being on your youth advisory board, to staying in touch with you for a couple years and then applying for a job as a youth worker at your agency. Also is really proud that some of the staff that we have at our agency used to be youth participants in our employment readiness programs and our um, youth task forces against violence programs. And those staff have such great ideas because they've been the young people we're trying to recruit. Um, so these are just some examples, some things to mull on. I know we have two minutes and I think there's a deal where we got to get out of the Zoom room quickly, but Luce or Kale, maybe you can let me know if we have a little bit of wiggle room and we have time for questions. But if not, I'm gonna put my email address in this chat um, Luz, could you move to the resources slide if we have time for that? Um, my email is in the chat and I would love to, um, one more, right there. Um, my email is in the chat. We had very limited time today. I would love to have one-on-ones with you all. If you want to send me an email, we can have a phone call. I have way more resources I can send you if you're looking for them. Um, I want to just point out the Adults Listen Up resource is a really great one. That's from Between Friends. That's a guide that teenagers made talking about the barriers um, to talking to adults about relationships. And I think that's a really great document to go through before you start thinking about this. Um, the, there's a resource on positive youth development, realizing the power of youth and youth leadership through advisory boards, learning for justice has tips for adult allies. And then on the Padlet, there's one more file, it's a PDF, and that is the tips from youth on how to make accessible, engaging youth advisory boards. Um, so Luce, we can stop screen sharing, thank you so much. Um, I'll stay in this room if we've got time. Um, and if folks want to ask questions, I can answer them here, or you can contact me via email. We'll schedule some time together. Bye, everybody. Have fun at your next sessions. Thank you. And Levi, yeah. I did have a question, Levi. So yeah. your, your organization that you work through, um, do you guys, uh, you said you still work with schools or you said you used to work with the schools? I used to work with schools at my uh, former uh, job. Um, I was a prevention yeah. educator. Okay. No, because it just were, um, we, I work at a school. I'm a, the dean of students at a, at a high school. Mm -hmm. And we were looking for different, you know, resources and organizations. That's the, one of the reasons why I went to, you know, the, 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 this, uh, the, the workshop. Mm -hmm. um, but I definitely am I'm interested if that's okay if I reach out to you because I, I, a lot of the things that you had said, um, we definitely need a lot of uh, help at our school with a lot of different uh, 
of, of with you know the the uh, the, the teen uh, domestic violence a lot of the different the dating you know so there's a lot of things that we we need uh, um i did see one of the resources you did put about between friends i think we've had them in the past and i think we've mm -hmm. tried uh, i think reaching out to them to see if they can uh, uh, do a, a, another workshop for us but definitely i'll, I'll uh, definitely contact you awesome thanks Kusaba. i thank definitely have so some more school-based resources we'll talk okay thank you thank you so much Lee. yeah